KBFK Rebel Alliance News, Los Angeles. In today's headlines, six officers and one nurse are charged with manslaughter after a DUI traffic stop. Pajaro farm workers still struggle for survival without government air. News from Santa Barbara. A look at the question of how stable is the U.S. dollar. The multipolar world in the making. And non-NATO news. All this and more coming up. Good evening, I'm Don DeBar. The sneaker company Adidas has retracted its opposition to Black Lives Matter using a three-strip design for its logo. Adidas earlier had asked the U.S. Trademark Office to reject an application by Black Lives Matter for a trademark featuring three parallel stripes claiming a trademark violation. Adidas was originally founded by a member of the Nazi party, Adolf Das, who was a German cobbler, inventor, entrepreneur, and the younger brother of Rudolf Dassler, the founder of Puma. According to a report in Reuters, the company withdrew the request over concerns it would be perceived as not being supportive of BLM. L.A. mansion owners are trying to offload properties before a 4% transfer tax on property sales over $5 million and a 5.5% tax on properties over $10 million goes into effect this Saturday, April 1st. There are reports that some sellers are dropping prices dramatically and, according to L.A. Taco News, quote, even throwing in a free McLaren or Bentley with a purchase, closed quote. Craft cannabis growers in California, primarily those with smaller harvests that tend to be more invested in quality than quantity, say they're frustrated by regulations requiring volume-focused distributors to act as middlemen for retail sales along with attached fees running from 10 to 22% in some cases. That good farm owner, Tamara Kislock, who helped found a direct-to-consumer site, Mendocino Cannabis Shop, said, quote, We're stuck in this crazy situation where we're legally mandated to work with distributors, and we're not even going to be able to get distribution, closed quote. KBFK Rebel Alliance News, Los Angeles. A California Highway Patrol sergeant, six officers, and a nurse were charged yesterday in the killing of a driver who shouted he couldn't breathe as officers kneeled on top of him while the nurse drew his blood in the parking lot of the Altadena, California Highway Police Station in 2020. The L.A. County DA's office charged the following officers and the nurse with involuntary manslaughter and assault by an officer in the death of 38-year-old Edward Bronstein. The officers were Sergeant Michael Little and Officers Dionisio Fiorella, Dustin Osmanson, Darren Parsons, Diego Romero, Justin Silva, and Marcial Terry. Arby Begalian, the involved nurse, was also charged with involuntary manslaughter. District Attorney George Gasson said in a statement, quote, for the system to work, People must be able to trust law enforcement. Police accountability is critical to building that trust, and it is necessary for public safety. I promise Mr. Bronstein's family and our community that I will continue to advocate for stronger accountability in use of force cases and an independent review of deaths that occur while in law enforcement custody, close quote. A cell phone video from a highway patrol supervisor recorded what happened on March 31st, 2020. The coroner's office, which is a division of the sheriff's department, did not rule the death a homicide, but rather has it marked as yet undetermined. In the video, which the DA's office played during a press conference earlier this week, Bronstein could be heard repeatedly saying, I can't breathe, I can't breathe. Attorney Louis Carrillo, who represents Bronstein's parents and two of his children, welcomed the DA's decision to file criminal charges. He said, quote, This is a step in the right direction because those officers will be held accountable. They took his life without reverence for human life, close quote. Bronstein had said 14 times that he couldn't breathe, according to Carrillo. Chip Commissioner Sean Durier 
said Wednesday that he extends his deepest condolences to Bronstein's family. A statement he issued said, quote, Our agency's top priority is protecting the safety and well-being of all Californians, and I am saddened that Mr. Bronstein died while in our custody and care. Any death in custody is a tragedy that we take with utmost seriousness. The officers and sergeant have been placed on administrative leave, according to California Highway Patrol. Officers Osmondson and Terry stopped Bronstein on suspicion of DUI when he was on the 5 freeway in Burbank in 2020. The officers took him to the parking lot of the Alta Dana CHP office at 2130 North Windsor Avenue and obtained a warrant to draw his blood, according to the DA's office. Bronstein originally refused to have his blood drawn, but agreed to do so as officers pushed him to the ground. According to the DA's statement, quote, Six officers are accused of forcing a handcuffed Bronstein to the ground and pinning him down as Begalian drew his blood. While pinned down, Bronstein repeatedly told officers he could not breathe. As the blood draw continued, Bronstein became unresponsive, close quote. Bronstein was kept face down for about six more minutes. The officers tried CPR on him about ten minutes after he was unresponsive. He never regained consciousness. The video was unsealed by a federal judge last year over the objection of the Attorney General's office. No arraignment date had been set as of Wednesday. The CHP has updated policies to, quote, prevent officers from using techniques or transport methods that involve a substantial risk of positional asphyxia, close quote, and also conduct training for officers to help them recognize individuals experiencing medical distress. This according to a department statement, which reads, quote, the CHP is exploring alternatives to administering mandated chemical tests when people arrested on suspicion of driving under the influence refuse to submit to testing as required by law, close quote. Don't push me cause I'm close to the edge. I'm trying not to lose my head. <laughs> it's like a jungle sometimes. It makes me wonder how I keep from going under. Thousands of farm workers and their families in Pajaro, California, continue to face homelessness and destitution as a result of the failure to maintain a levee which flooded. These farm workers who provide our food, have been left with their homes flooded in contaminated mud. Pacifica's Steve Zeltzer interviewed Eloy Ortiz with Special Projects Manager Regeneracion, Pajaro Valley Climate Action, and a volunteer and board member at the Center for Farm Workers' Families. He also spoke with Pamela Sexton, who's a member of the Pajaro Valley Federation of Teachers, She's been supporting relief efforts for the farm workers and their families. This is Steve Zeltzer with Work Week, and we've been covering the struggle of Pajaro uh, farm workers, the flooding there, and we wanted to have an update about the, their conditions, the, the struggle to go back to their homes, and uh, also uh, the historic struggle of the farm workers for justice and have an environmentally safe place. And these farm workers do a critical work for our society, producing food. Um, and they have been through a, a lot of difficult times, including COVID. So I mean, this, this flooding is adding to um, that. What is the situation? Because are they getting support now? And is the state of California and other agencies giving them support because they don't have a lot of money to begin with? Yeah, so there, uh, so we do have some nonprofits uh, in the area, mostly on the Santa Cruz County side, uh, who are who have already started to give out aid to uh, some farm workers. Uh, unfortunately, they are often um, hampered by their uh, requirements for providing aid. Uh, so there's not so. Farm workers, what it comes down to usually is farm workers who have doc, who do not have documentation. You know, a lot of farm workers come over, they don't even have identification. Uh, their literacy level is very low. They, you know, we ask them their address, they, they'll take a piece of paper out of their wallet. So just proving who you are is very difficult for many farm workers, especially those who, uh, who are indigenous speakers. Um, there's, you know, so I guess what I'm saying is, there are nonprofits who are connecting with farm workers, but those without documentation, those who cannot prove who they are, or, you know, they may not be on a lease in Pajaro, uh, those, 
um, it comes down to organizations like the one I volunteer for, the Center for Farm Worker Families, that can provide um, aid because we receive general grants from um, from support from foundations, from supporters. Uh, but you know what I will tell you is it's not enough. We can, we cannot bring in enough money through our donors to assist farm workers financially for any long amount of time. And how many families are we talking about? How many workers and families are we talking about in the Paro Valley? A thousand. Two to three thousand people have been evacuated. And and so we're talking about both um, farm workers who were living in Pajaro in extremely overcrowded, um, dense um, accommodations. And we're also talking about small businesses um, small businesses that serve that community. A lot of those business were also, businesses um, were also renting their spaces. So um, we've got, you know, vulnerable local businesses alongside extremely vulnerable farm workers who, um, when I say dense population, like, we're talking sometimes three families in a house that's meant for, um, you know, two or three people, um, bunk beds, and it's it's not um, standard accommodations. Yeah. And oh, when on. you go to Pajaro now, because Pajaro opened up on Thursday of last week. Um, It opened up so that families and businesses could come back and assess their properties. But um, there's still no clean water. And it'll be weeks before there's clean water. Um, A lot of families are not able to stay there. They're still in temporary shelters. I know Eloy just visited today. I visited on um, Friday was the last time I was there. Eloy, do you want to talk about what you saw today? Uh, so, uh, so I did walk from Watsonville, from downtown Watsonville, just right over the bridge to Pajaro Middle School, which is, which is kind of in the central, um, central Four area K, of the PFK. town. PFK, uh, As you ball. walk through, you, you know, what, what you see is people have basically gutted their homes and have put it on the sidewalk. It's just very... Uh, it feels like a post-apocalyptic movie almost where you're, you see a character kind of walking through the remains of a town. That's what it feels like. Um, you see people just kind of cleaning out, cleaning the mud out still. We talked to a, a, a market owner who, who her family, they've been working on her market since Thursday and they're still kind of getting all the mud out. I actually, uh, I stepped in clay t- in the mud today, and I, I can tell you, it's it's. I've tried to spray it off, but it's still with me. It it stays with you. It's thick, and um, you know, one thing that I can talk. One thing is talking about it, but being there and kind of smelling. Um, you know, you can already smell kind of the uh, the odors of um, you know the sediment and the um you know the human material kind of all mixed together i just i kind of fear for people just inhaling kind of the the air of that mixture as as it gets heated up as we go into the spring and summer and it's just going to be a bad it's it's not a good situation um there are people who want to, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm cutting you off, but there are people who want to help and they bring things, uh, but there's no place, there's no place to kind of set up a resource center. Um, you know, there's no, it's a very congested area there. As Pam said, there are multiple families living in a home. There aren't any parking spaces. So uh, people want to, want to come to Barho and bring farm worker supplies, but there's literally nowhere that's, that's an open space to to kind of host these people, these good Samaritans who want to bring in resources. Um, you know, I, a group came and, and they literally blocked off the sidewalk because there was nowhere for them to set up. It's just, um, it's an under-resourced community. It's a poorly planned community. It's a forgotten community. And that's what people, if you talk to people there who've been there a long time, that's what they will tell you. That's what they feel like. 
And President Biden came to Santa Cruz uh, during um, another, uh, you know, catastrophe. Um, and there are facilities. There's the county fairgrounds. Why hasn't the county um, and the state made sure that there's housing for these people? Because they're critical, uh, the necessity that they face. And it sounds like there are thousands of them. So, so I, what I could say, what we first should say is Santa Cruz Pajaro is located in Monterey County. So that's, that's some, so Biden did come to Santa Cruz County, uh, even though he did land in Watsonville and there was damage in Watsonville. He did not tour Watsonville. Of course, he went to Capitola, which, you know, hey, if I could, I, I, you know, I like Capitola Village also, but Pajaro is in Monterey County. What I will say is, um, Pajaro is geographically separated from the, from the rest of Monterey. It's culturally separated from the rest of Monterey County. It's, um, language wise, there's quite a, um, discrepancy between Pajaro and the rest of Monterey County. A lot of many farm workers over the past 10 years have come from our indigenous language speakers from Oaxaca. So they speak, uh, one of several indigenous languages, uh, so there's just kind of a cultural, geographical, um, yeah, it's just a disinvestment, a just un disinvestment of that particular community. Um, again, what I will tell you is the residents, long-term residents, feel like they are not getting support from Monterey County, and they are not getting support, and they feel more connected to Watsonville because they're just connected to Watsonville over the, over the bridge. But they also feel like, you know, even though they are connected to Watsonville, they, they're like the forgotten stepchild of both areas. And there was some reporting that uh, they knew that there was a weakness of the, the levy that could have been prevented uh, if they had done the proper maintenance of that levy. But that wasn't done in part because of uh, the area, the poverty and the, the fact it was low income, a working class farm worker community. Is that true? That's true. That's true. And it, so it has to do with this cost benefit analysis. And, and this speaks to the systemic economic inequities and systemic racial injustice. So because of very low property rates, even though back in the 1960s, the Army Corps of Engineer reports it said, okay, we've got, um, this is substandard, there needs to be work done on this um, on this levy since the 60s, it wasn't done. It was just approved uh, some months ago to have it done in 2024. Well, now this has happened. This was known for decades and it could have been prevented. So yeah, one of the things I've been trying to tell people, like my family will call and ask if I'm okay. Yes, I'm okay. Um, and and to be clear, this is not a natural disaster. This is a disaster caused by neglect and the neglect of a community, as Eloy said, that has that continues to be neglected. That is is disenfranchised, disregarded, because they are largely undocumented. They're, it feels, to many of the people I talk to, um, to what I see, it, it's like they're discardable. And, and we're saying, no, no, they're not. And we're calling on our local county officials to first, um, implement a eviction moratorium. Families and these small businesses I mentioned are in, are at risk of being evicted, um, crisis on top of crisis. And, and then other supports that are gonna help people really recover. And at the state level also, it was just recently decided, like the criteria wasn't met for FEMA because of these same calculations that are based on the property value. And because the, the residential property value is so low, it didn't meet FEMA requirements. Again, discarding the, the human cost here. So what we're, 
what we're speaking to is an issue of human rights and and writing a long time wrong. That was KPFK's Steve Zeltzer speaking with Eloy Ortiz and Pamela Sexton about the situation in Pajaro Valley. We'll be right back with Santa Barbara News from Marcy Winograd. KPFK Rebel Alliance News, Los Angeles. The Santa Barbara Independent reports that beginning this week, 30,000 Santa Barbara County families may find themselves struggling to feed their families with $178 or less per month than they received during the COVID pandemic. Recipients will still receive food stamps, better known as SNAP benefits, but at the pre-pandemic level. With food prices 11% higher this January than they were last year, the Food Bank of Santa Barbara County predicts a hunger gap or hunger cliff with people unsure of where their next meal will come. The cut in food stamps occurs at a time when heavy rains in the Santa Barbara area have meant fewer days on the job for those who pick crops or work construction. As a result, the Food Bank of Santa Barbara is asking the public to help raise $500,000 to feed everyone in need. This in light of the fact that the cut in food stamps will hit the county pocketbook with a $5 million loss in federal food assistance. The Independent reports social service workers are bracing for a tsunami of phone calls from SNAP recipients wondering what's happening and requesting hearings on why their benefits were reduced. In other news, the Santa Barbara County Sheriff's Office together with Project Opioid, is supporting the distribution of Narcan, a drug that reverses what can be deadly effects of an opioid overdose. Santa Barbara County last year saw 168 overdose deaths, overdose deaths related to fentanyl. That's a record high for the county. So this week, the Santa Barbara County Sheriff's Office is hosting a free Narcan distribution program through the Department of Healthcare Services at the Sheriff's Headquarters, on Calle Real in Santa Barbara, as well as at the Carpinteria and Santa Maria substations. That's not just this week, but in the weeks to come as well. This program aims to distribute Narcan to members of the public and increase awareness about the opioid crisis and the importance of Narcan in saving lives. Members of the public can come to the lobby of any of those substations or the main sheriff station during business hours to receive the drug free of charge to receive Narcan, that is. Meanwhile, the Santa Barbara Unified School District is moving ahead to install Narcan stations on all of its public school campuses. The goal, to install the anti-overdose medication stations at the district's nine elementary schools, four junior high campuses, and four high schools. Charter schools, however, are not included in this plan. And in the wake of this week's horrible mass shooting, of three students and three adults at a school in Tennessee, the Independent reports the Santa Barbara County Sheriff's Department will require and has been requiring applicants for concealed carry permits go through a rigorous application process. What does this look like? Well, an applicant must write an essay, submit written testimonials from others vouching for the applicant's character, be interviewed by someone in the Sheriff's Office, undergo a lengthy psychological attest psychological test administered by a department-approved psychologist and complete several firearm safety training forms. Sheriff Bill Brown has received so far 296 applicants or applications for concealed carry permits that since last summer when the Supreme Court ruled that many of the key regulatory hurdles imposed by some counties and cities throughout the nation were unconstitutional. Sheriff Brown says his department has issued 156 concealed weapons licenses since last summer. Over in Solvang, that's a Danish-themed tourist spot in the Santa Inez Valley, residents are asking the city council to reconsider its refusal to allow a rainbow crosswalk and Pride Month banners from polls this June. Several speakers testified before the council on Monday night. They said the banners on light poles for Pride Month would send a welcoming message to the LGBTQ community. K-12 
Akil Kavali, he's president of the Rainbow House. That's a, a resource center and safe place for members of the LGBTQ community. He said to the council, I stand here before you, not only as a citizen, but as a human, a business owner, a father, a proud gay man, to say what you did at the last council meeting was completely inappropriate, unprofessional, disrespectful, and very disappointing. Opponents of the Rainbow Crosswalk apparently complained that it would spook the horses in the parade. Earlier, some of the council members who voted against the gay pride banner said it would favor one business over another. Will the Solvang Council change its mind? Hmm, Stay tuned. The gay pride item was not on the agenda for Monday night, so the council did not formally reconsider it. In Santa Barbara on Chumash land, I'm Marcy Winograd for KPFK's Rebel Alliance News. KPFK Rebel Alliance News, Los Angeles. It's been a tough week for the U.S. dollar. On Wednesday, China and Brazil announced that they'd reached a deal to trade in their own currencies, ditching the dollar as an intermediary. That deal will have China, the top global rival to U.S. economic hegemony, and Brazil, the largest economy in Latin America, conducting their massive trade and financial transactions directly, exchanging each other's currencies without going through the dollar. China is Brazil's largest trading partner. As of January of last year, its exports to China totaled $87.6 billion dollars, nearly triple the $31.1 billion in exports to the United States, while Brazil's imports from China totaled $47.6 billion compared to $39.3 billion from the U.S. And that discrepancy is growing, with bilateral trade hitting a record $150 billion last year. Also, in what may signal the coming end of the domination of the petrodollar, China completed the settlement of its first trade of liquefied natural gas in its own currency, the yuan, as reported by the Shanghai Petroleum and Natural Gas Exchange on Tuesday. That trade involved around 65,000 tons of LNG imported from the United Arab Emirates. And Saudi Arabia announced it has approved partner status in the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, the political, economic, and security bloc currently chaired by China. This follows a February report that Riyadh is interested in joining the BRICS group, Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa. Aside from the Saudis, Iran, Nigeria, Venezuela, and others have expressed interest also in joining the BRICS. More and more nations are now looking to join the various multilateral organizations challenging the U.S. dollar's hegemony in Africa, Latin America, and Asia, Kim Iverson takes a look at what the implications might be for the global economy. It's inevitable. The U.S. is losing its dominance on the world stage, and the dollar will soon no longer be the world's reserve currency. And that's scary for many of us. And we've seen what happens to other countries when their currency is devalued and massive inflation hits, oftentimes caused by U.S. sanctions, and we don't want that happening to us. But during last week's meeting between Putin and Xi, Xi said this to Putin. Change is coming that hasn't happened in a hundred years, and we are driving this change together, he said. Now, over the weekend, an interesting thing happened. Both CNN and Fox News ran stories about the end of U.S. dollar hegemony. Here's CNN's Fareed Zakaria talking about the desire for BRICS countries to move to the eon as glo- the global currency. Putin said, we are in favor of using the Chinese yuan for settlements between Russia and the countries of Asia, Africa, and Latin America. So, the world's second largest economy and its largest energy exporter are together actively trying to dent the dollar's dominance as the anchor of the international financial system. Now here's Fox and Friends Weekend talking about the shift away from the U.S. dollar by BRICS nations. We're putting announced this week that Russia will begin using the Chinese yuan for international payments instead of the dollar. Saudi Arabia is also in talks with Beijing to do the same thing. And they can even be joining the BRIC countries, which is an acronym for these countries here, Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa. These countries all have emerging economies. So 
what happens if our economy and the U.S. dollar are no longer the world's dominant currency? But right now, what we know is that if both left and right mainstream media are talking about it, you know that this is something that's serious. So first of all, what is BRICS and how can it topple U.S. dollar dominance? It's kind of like the G7. It's an alliance for peace, security, development, and cooperation. Essentially, these are really large, powerful nations that honestly just feel like they've been ostracized by the West and are looking to develop into nations that they believe they can become. And they decided that rather than waiting for an invite to the table, it's best to just start their own. And that's what they did. So now more nations want to seat at their table, and some of them are extremely consequential. Right now, there are about 20 known countries wishing to become part of the BRICS alliance. Among them are Turkey, Mexico, Indonesia, Argentina, Saudi Arabia, the UAE, Egypt, and a number of African countries. But most significant on this list would be Mexico and Saudi Arabia. Now, let's talk about Mexico potentially joining BRICS. Uh, reports have been coming out that Mexico was seeking to join the countries uh, in this alliance that they were looking for to really sort of expand their economic uh, footprint around the world. They're right on our border. And we've seen what has happened around the world when other leaders uh, tried to challenge U.S. global hegemony. Uh, they end up like Gaddafi. And you've got people right now in Congress posturing about sending troops into Mexico to fight the cartels, which very well just could be a cover for why we would really need to go into Mexico, and that's to prevent them from joining BRICS. It wouldn't be about the cartels. We've been dealing with the cartels for a long time. The real reason why the United States might want to strong arm or uh, posture against Mexico is to scare it away from joining the BRICS nations. That would be the real reason there. Saudi Arabia would actually be the real consequential kicker. If Saudi Arabia were to join BRICS, this would change everything. And not just for the U.S., not just for U.S. hegemony around the world, not just for the power of the dollar and the sanctions that the U.S. could put on other countries. This would affect you and me. So let's talk about why Saudi Arabia even uses the dollar to begin with. This was a deal that was done back in 1951. The U.S. did a security deal with Saudi Arabia where we would protect them in exchange for oil being sold exclusively in dollars. This was a deal that worked out well for both nations. Saudi Arabia got their security. The United States ensured that the value of the dollar remained high by ensuring that all oil was done in dollars. Because of this, and this is where it gets to massive inflation, because of this deal, every single nation on earth wanting oil needed to get their hands on dollars. So the U.S. dollar became in high demand. The central bank, of course, prints dollars, sends dollars all around, sends these dollars to other central banks. So dollars are everywhere. There is now, because of this deal that was done oh, 70 years ago, dollars have flooded the world. Every country in the world needs dollars. And we've seen what happens to countries who can't get dollars. Maybe the United States has them on their list and ultimately they, they're not able to get the dollars they need. We've seen this happen to Iran, to Venezuela, to many other nations around the globe. Dollars are in demand. They've been weaponized. When the dollars are no longer in demand because there's another currency that could be used to buy oil, what happens with those dollars? They need to go somewhere. So they start flooding back into the United States. And when they flood back into the United States, we are looking at record levels of inflation like you and I could not even imagine. You think the inflation we're dealing with right now is bad? Just wait for when all of those dollars start getting dumped onto U.S. soil. And that might actually already have something to do with our current inflation crisis. And maybe the powers that be just don't want to admit it. But ultimately, if Saudi Arabia decides that they no longer need U.S. security, which, let's face it, it's not clear they do. I mean, at this point, who's really threatening Saudi Arabia and the Middle East anymore? They just did a peace deal with Iran, essentially, with China brokering that deal. Iraq is not really a, a threat to Saudi Arabia. They're not really dealing with the same level of threats in the Middle East that they used to. And as these nations get along, it will only become even more stable. So Saudi Arabia is starting to rethink their deal thinking, well, we don't really need the United States as much anymore. And so why are we just ensuring that every single barrel of oil gets sold in dollars and then the U.S. goes around and bullies countries all around the world? Nobody wants to be the next Russia. They see what's happening to Russia. They don't want that happening to them. They don't like the U.S. 
exerting their power, abusing power in this way, and they're looking for an alternative. And so Saudi Arabia is starting to rethink their deal. They're not so certain they have a true partnership with the United States, and they're looking at diversifying their accounts. But when those dollars start getting dumped back onto the U.S. shore, we are going to see a massive, massive amount of inflation here in the United States. So much so that I guarantee you politicians in Washington will do anything they can to prevent that sort of catastrophic, and believe me, it would be catastrophic inflation. They would be willing to go to war over it. And that is why we're seeing such an increase in all of the war posturing against uh, Russia, against China. What are we going to do when those dollars start getting dumped here onto, US, onto the U.S. shore? Of course, uh, the Federal Reserve already has uh, an answer for that, right? They want to go to central bank digital currency. They're trying to move us towards these other things, trying to salvage the whole situation. But ultimately, what do we end up with? A surveillance state, a big brother state. We end up in a place that is unrecognizable from where we are right now, and that is potentially where we're headed. So it's time to start having these conversations. What are we going to do? What are we going to do other than wage World War III? That is the, the, the big question. And that was Kim Iverson taking a look at the multipolar world that's coming into view. Up next, Polina Vasilyev brings us news from around the world outside of the propaganda machine of NATO with the non-NATO news. Here are today's international highlights with a special focus on non-NATO media. Deputy spokesperson for the UN Secretary General Farhan Haq was grilled by a CGTN correspondent after the official said there were no U.S. armed forces in Syria. At this stage, what's the, what's the difference at, at between, this stage, between there's, Syria, there's no, the situation in Syria and the situation in Ukraine? There's no U.S. armed forces inside mm -hmm. of Syria. Uh, and so, uh, so I don't have a it's it's not a you're, parallel you're, situation. You're, you're to sure some of the there's no there's no U.S. U.S. military personnel. I, I believe Syria. there's military activity. Yeah. But uh, but uh, but uh, in terms of a ground presence in Syria, I'm not aware of that. Okay, five U.S. service members were injured in that attack. If there's no there were no U.S. soldier service members in Syria, how could they got injured? Uh, That's weird, right? U.S. military bases in Syria were attacked just last week. Damascus has accused the U.S. of stealing oil from the country under the guise of a supposed anti-terrorism operation. Meanwhile, the U.S., which is believed to have had forces in Syria for nearly a decade, has openly called for regime change in the country. Esteban Carrillo is the news editor of the Cradle Media Outlet. He says the U.S. military presence in Syria violates international law. It sounded like he was misinformed, but it also uh, raised the question of whether this was a UN official or a US State Department spokesperson trying to, to defend the indefensible. The presence of, uh, of the US Army in Syria is illegal by international law. So, and this in the UN, was in the UN form uh, after uh, the Second World War to, to defend international law and to, and to prevent uh, conflicts like this from erupting. But now it seems the UN has been uh, turn into simply another tool to to justify these uh, illegal invasions and these uh, the plundering of the of the of Syria's resources and these uh, strategy towards regime change. It's about controlling the oil producing areas of Syria. What it does uh, allow them to do is to to pressure the government in Damascus to to pressure the people, uh, which on top of economic sanctions, the government cannot uh, cannot uh, use their own resources. That has been the the strategy since the start of this war in Syria. It has been to oust the government of, of Bashar al-Assad. Ukrainians are demanding that the government refrain from using highly toxic depleted uranium because of the danger it poses to the environment. RT has more. A petition has been published on the website of President Volodymyr Zelensky's office demanding that Ukrainian soldiers be banned from using depleted uranium munitions. No valuable piece of equipment is worth harming humanity due to the military use of uranium and other radioactive elements. I demand to consider this petition positively and take protective measures to prevent the use of such ammunition by the armed forces of Ukraine until the final consideration of the petition. 
This comes as the UK government confirmed last week that it would supply Ukraine with shells containing depleted uranium, a byproduct of the uranium enrichment process needed to create nuclear weapons. Russian President Vladimir Putin has warned Moscow would be forced to respond if the UK goes ahead with those shipments. Meanwhile, around 1 million similar shells were used during the US invasion of Iraq in 2003, and this led to environmental and health problems that continue to have an impact on the population today, such as increased cancer rates as well as birth defects. Suad Naji al-Azawi, Iraqi environmental pollution activist and researcher, says as long as profits are made by the military-industrial complex, concerns about people will be secondary. If they approve that these weapons can affect civilian health and uh, well-being, that means they will criminalize the army, their armies, the, the American and the British armies, who um, use these weapons in highly populated areas. And now, instead of um, spending billions of dollars to manage and isolate this hazard waste, they are sending and selling selling this, these weapons uh, to other parts of the world, using, using them in the wars. They use it because it, it brings billions of dollars for them, and they don't care about other countries, people, and environment. A vigil was held in Gaza to support the Al-Aqsa Mosque amid a surge in Israeli violations. Ola Elasi has more. A vigil has been held in Gaza to condemn the spike in Israeli violations of the Al-Aqsa Mosque and the West Bank. Over the past few days and with the beginning of the holy month of Ramadan, dozens of Israeli forces stormed the vicinity of the compound of Al-Aqsa Mosque. They assaulted and placated Muslim worshippers and forced them out of the holy site, paving the way for Israeli far-right extremists to enter the mosque. That prompted Palestinians and resistance factions to reiterate their readiness to defend Al-Aqsa and repeat the 2021 Operation Sword Al-Quds if the Al-Aqsa status quo is violated. The Palestinian news to just look at the situation in the West Bank and Al-Aqsa Mosque. These violations across the red line and the Palestinian people began to lose their patience. The Palestinian resistance has something to say if the occupation regime crosses our red line. Palestinians and Muslims reject the temporal and spatial division of the Al-Aqsa Mosque between Muslims and Jews. This is why Israel keeps violating the internationally agreed status quo of the mosque. Ramadan every year witnesses Israeli attacks against Palestinians gathered in the holy place. In 2021, the expulsion of Palestinian families from their homes in Al-Quds and the Israeli raids on Al-Aqsa Mosque during the holy month of Ramadan led to an 11-day accretion on Gaza. More than 260 Palestinians were killed during the assault, including 67 children and 41 women. Over 2,000 Palestinians were injured and many more internally displaced. Our message to the Israeli occupation is that preaching the sincerity of Al-Aqsa Mosque puts Israel on the verge of a collapse. Because our people will never remain silent over these violations, nor will they accept the temporal division of Al-Aqsa. A surge in Israeli settler violence and military raids on Palestinian towns have claimed the lives of more than 90 Palestinians since the start of this year. That makes 2023 the deadliest year in decades in the occupied East Al-Quds and the West Bank. We in Gaza are telling you that you can count on us. We support you in each and every step of operation you take against the Israeli occupation regime. We salute your struggle and return to our steadfastness towards our land. We will never leave our land. There are concerns that tensions in the occupied territories would escalate as Israeli forces and settlers continue their attacks on Palestinians and violate their sanctities in clear defiance of calls to stop the violence. The repeated Israeli attacks against the Palestinians in the West Bank and the regime's flagrant violations of the Holy Al-Aqsa Mosque during the fasting month of Ramadan have been met with strong condemnations here in Gaza, where people express their unwavering support for Al-Quds and Al-Aqsa Mosque. Al-Alasi, Press TV, Gaza. And that's all in today's international highlights from non-NATO media. For KPFK, I'm Paulina Vasiliev. 
KPFK Rebel Alliance News, Los Angeles. In breaking news, the Manhattan DA's office announced that the grand jury has indicted former President Donald Trump. Very few details were available at press time, but according to a report in the Associated Press, a Manhattan grand jury voted to indict Donald Trump on charges involving payments made during the 2016 presidential campaign to silence claims of an extramarital sexual encounter. The indictment confirmed Thursday by Joe Tacopina, a lawyer for Trump, and by other people familiar with the matter, according to the Associated Press, follows years of investigations into Trump's business, political, and personal dealings. Tracopina said in a statement referring to Trump, quote, he did not commit any crime. We will vigorously fight this political prosecution in court, closed quote. The Manhattan DA's investigation centered on money paid to Stormy Daniels and to former Playboy model Karen McDougal to silence possible claims that they had had extramarital encounters with him. The former president has denied any wrongdoing and repeatedly has attacked the investigation as politically motivated. He is expected to surrender to authorities next week, although details were still being worked out, according to this report. In bringing the charges, the Manhattan DA is embracing an unusual case that had been investigated by two previous sets of prosecutors, both of whom declined to seek indictment. In the weeks leading up to this indictment, the former president attacked the case on social media. Meanwhile, the district attorney in Atlanta has for two years investigated claims that Trump and his allies attempted to meddle in Georgia's 2020 vote count. And a Justice Department special counsel was investigating Trump's storage of classified documents at his Mar-a-Lago home in Florida. The fate of the present investigation seemed uncertain. Earlier in March, the Manhattan DA apparently invited the former president to testify before a grand jury. His attorneys declined the invitation, as is usual, but a lawyer closely allied with the former president briefly testified with respect to the credibility of Trump's former lawyer, Michael Cohen. At issue is a payment made by Cohen to Stormy Daniels of about $130,000 that was made late in the 2016 campaign. It was reportedly about an alleged sexual encounter between the two that took place 10 years prior after they had met at a celebrity golf tournament. Earlier in 2016, Cohen allegedly also arranged for the publisher of the National Enquirer to pay Playboy model Karen McDougal $150,000 to squelch her claim of a Trump affair. Federal prosecutors in New York ultimately charged Cohen in 2018 with violating federal campaign finance laws. They argued that the payments amounted to impermissible assistance to Trump's presidential campaign. Cohen pleaded guilty to those charges and unrelated tax evasion charges and served some time in federal prison. Trump was reportedly implicated in some court filings as having knowledge of the arrangements, but prosecutors at the time refused to bring criminal charges against him. The former Manhattan DA, Cyrus Vance Jr., then took up the investigation in 2019. While that investigation initially focused on the money payments to the two women, Vance's prosecutors moved on to other matters, including an examination of Trump's business dealings and tax strategies. Vance ultimately charged the Trump Organization and its CFO with tax fraud related to fringe benefits paid to some of the company's top executives. The current Manhattan DA campaigned on a promise to, quote, get Trump, close quote. He hired longtime white-collar prosecutor Matthew Colangelo to investigate and convene a new grand jury. Cohen became a key witness, meeting with prosecutors nearly two dozen times and providing other evidence before the grand jury. Trump has termed the investigation the greatest witch hunt in history. And we'll have more on that tomorrow. Earlier this week, the former president was interviewed by Fox News' Sean Hannity, and he addressed the pending indictment. Mr. President, great to see you again. Thank you very much, John. Thank you for doing this. As reported, as you know, you're facing a lot of legal challenges. In your opinion, does this help you or hurt you in terms of your chances to win in 2024? Well, if you listen to the fake news media, it helps. 
uh, because they're all saying it's a scam. Even even people that don't like me are saying this is a terrible thing to do for our country. Uh, I don't know whether it helps or hurts. I can tell you, in my opinion, it's a new way of cheating on elections. It's called election interference. What they're doing is if they can't win at the ballot box because I'm leading everybody by a lot in the polls for every Republican, frankly, and every Democrat by a lot, including Biden, by a lot. And uh, they can't beat you that way. They're going to do this kind of stuff. This has uh, never been done like this before in the history of our country to this extent. Uh, people are pleading with the prosecutor, don't do it, don't do it, it's wrong. Even Democrats, even people that traditionally are not exactly my fans are saying, don't do it. Because I didn't do anything wrong. I did nothing wrong. Let me ask you this then. And I thought about this last week. You were the president of the United States. And I saw your post on Truth uh, Social. And I read the reports in the New York Times and I saw pundits all over media uh, speculating that you're, you were going to be arrested. That would mean you'd be arrested. A couple you, of weeks ago. You'd be arraigned. Yeah. That you'd be, there'd be a mugshot, you'd be fingerprinted and maybe even handcuffed. Now, when you think about being at 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue and juxtapose it to that, how do you deal with that? Well, I deal with it. We're dealing with very dishonest people. We're dealing with thugs. We're dealing with people I actually believe that hate our country. Uh, last night I had a rally with tens of thousands of people. Like the press admitted there were at least 25 or 30,000 people. That means you can double it, at least in Texas, Waco, Texas. And uh, it was like a love fest. It was incredible. And at the same time, these are people that really feel that they've been uh, hurt by the way this country is being run. Look at what, in Texas, as an example, in Arizona, look at what they're going through at the border. But that's really affected all. They just happen to walk through Texas and Arizona. It's affecting every, every state in the union. It's affecting our country. We have people pouring. I mean, I predict at the end, because they're giving phony numbers, they're giving fake numbers. I predict at the end of the year, it'll be 15 million people. That's larger than New York State. We'll come in here from mental institutions, insane asylums, as they used to call it, from prisons. You know, the prisons are being emptied out all over South America, and they're being dropped, the people are being dropped into our country. The mental institutions are being emptied out all over South America, but much more than that, all over the world. And they're traveling in through our southern border. I had the strongest, safest southern border in recorded history. It was nothing even close, including for drugs. You know, drugs are coming in at the rate of 10 times what they were three years ago. Think of that. I want Our to, country, to get into the all people of, are really hurt by it. I'm going to get it. I'll get into the economy. I'll get into immigration, energy, and all of that in a second. I, and these are important issues because the country has changed dramatically in just true. Two, a little over two years. It's true. I want to ask you about this. Um, you're dealing with three major investigations. Last week reports, and I want to hand you two documents, and I'll explain what they are in a second. Yeah. So last week reports in the press, Alvin Bragg's office, the Manhattan DA is in total, complete chaos, disagreement regarding your case. Um, Monday of last week, Bob Costello gives devastating testimony in terms of if you're looking for an indictment from the grand jury. To then the other side. One of the letters I gave you is from February of 2018, yes. Michael Cohn's lawyer, yeah. and that was exculpatory towards you. Totally. And your company and the campaign. And lastly, TMZ had a report, they brought it back out that I saw, and it was in the Daily Mail, Washington Post. And the second, the second piece that I put up, and put it up on the screen, is Stormy Daniels' denial mm -hmm. in writing that you ever had a relationship. Yeah. So my question is this. And denied it on many other occasions, too. I never had a relationship with her. I never had an affair with her. It's all made up. So my, here's my question. So with all this information that came out in your favor, you talked about death and destruction. And then you, the baseball bat picture yeah. next to Alvin Bragg, and you did take that down. And my only question is why open yourself up to criticism? You have to understand that when the story was put up, I put up a story, we didn't see pictures, we put up a story that was very exculpatory, very good story from the standpoint of what we're talking about. And they put up a picture of me 
And you know where I was holding the baseball bat? It was at the White House. Make America, buy America, because they did a lot of buy America things. And this is a company that makes ba baseball bats. Then they put next to that picture a picture mm -hmm. of Alvin Bragg. I didn't do it. They did it. These were two separate pictures. I was promoting made in America. You make these baseball bats instead of sending over to Japan and China and all other places where they're made. This was a company, good company, that makes baseball bats and other things like that in America. They took that picture from the White House and they put it up and then they put a picture of Alvin Bragg up. Look, here's a letter from Stormy Daniels saying we never had an affair. Here's a letter from a very highly respected gentleman, uh, Stephen Ryan, a very highly respected uh, firm uh, McDermott, Will, and Emery, but Stephen Ryan's respected. He writes a letter saying everything I said was right, everything that his client, this is his lawyer, not my lawyer. And Bob Costello is one of the most respected lawyers anywhere in the country. Uh, he served in the government at the highest positions, all of that. He went in because he witnessed, he was a lawyer for Michael Cohn. He went in because he saw what Michael Cohn was saying. And he said, that's a lie. That's terrible what he's saying. He was saying. on my show last week. I know that. And yeah. I thought he was amazing and fantastic. Mm -hmm. And he's doing that out of civic duty. He's not doing that for any reason. I don't know Bob Costello, by the way. I don't know him. Uh, I know he represents people that I'm, I'm close to in some ways. But I have to tell I don't know him. I know this. He's a highly respected person. And he couldn't stand to see. This was his line. He couldn't stand to see. This guy who's already a convicted, I mean, he's a felon. He's been to jail. And this is on stuff not having to do with me. His reputation is terrible. Now, before all of this happened, his reputation was he was a normal lawyer. Mm -hmm. So it made sense to use somebody like that. They always like to say a fixer. He was a fixer. He was a, they use that term. He was, a fixer. he was a lawyer, but he was one of many, many lawyers that I used. That letter goes on to say, in private, a private transaction, before the U.S. presidential election, Mr. Cohn used his own personal funds right. to facilitate the $130,000 payment to Ms. Clifford. Neither the Trump organization nor the Trump campaign was a party to the transaction with Ms. Clifford, and neither reimbursed Mr. Cohn for payment directly or indirectly, and that they go on to say neither Cohn or his LLC made, made any in-kind contributions to you, your campaign for president, or any presidential campaign committee, and that he was not a government employee at the time, and the payment in question does not con constitute a campaign contribution. That's their star witness. We will continue to cover this as it develops. You've been listening to KPFK Rebel Alliance News. We bring you progressive news for all of Southern California and hope to connect with you in the local community. If you want to become part of our news show, if you have story ideas or comments, please email us at news at kpfk.org. Please support KPFK to keep the lights on. We depend on you for donations since we do not accept corporate funding to keep us independent. We need to raise $100,000 every month to keep going. So please go to kpfk.org and donate now. Thank you so much for listening. Rebel Alliance News will be back tomorrow at 6 p.m. Thanks to our engineer, Wendell Handy, and all of the Rebel Alliance News contributors. Coming up next is American Indian Airwaves. Thank you so much for listening. We hope you'll join us again tomorrow at 6. For KPFK and Rebel Alliance News, I'm Don DeBar.